by leave withdrawn. Amendment 114, Lord Wrigley. Uh, I was about to move Amendment 114 and to speak to Amendments 115B, 115C and 123, which also stand in my name and which are grouped with it. First of all, my Lords, could I say a word about the whole issue of fracking? Noble Lords will be aware that when this bill was given a second reading, there was no reference to the provision the bill now makes in relation to fracking. When we first started in the committee, there was no sign of the amendments we knew were being prepared. Ostensibly, we had to wait until the conclusion of the consultation process in August before amendments were formulated. But since little notice seems to have been taken of the overwhelming opposition to fracking expressed by the general public, this seems to have been little short of a charade. It is not good enough to take an arrogant and disparaging attitude to those who harbour genuine fears. The, I, now that um, we have the amendments in the bill and the provision for fracking likely to be confirmed as part of this bill as we move for, forward from report stage, unless we challenge it rigorously um, tonight, then the fears that people have will be uh, underlined and reinforced. That's why I've tabled my amendments. But before, before I address the detailed wor wording, may I make it clear why I unreservedly oppose the application of fracking technology to extract underground gas. I have great res reservations about this technology, and in expressing these doubts and concerns, I don't do so on the basis of a NIMBY approach. There are no identified areas of potential fracking activities in my home county of Gwynedd, nor do I harbour doubts about any form of modern applied technology. My university degree many years ago was in physics, and I rejoice in the progress of science in making life so much better for millions around the world. But science needs to be applied with a degree of the precautionary principle. We all remember the tragedies of thalidomide, the dangers of radiation exposure, and the potential disaster associated with CFCs in the atmosphere. It's just as stupid to, be, to blindly accept the application of science as it is to, blind, uh, to blindly apply a knee-jerk reaction against the wonders of modern science and what they can bring us. We need a balanced approach. And that means asking awkward questions and challenging glib assumptions. And that, my lords, is what I want to do in regard to our apparent acceptance of fracking technology. The dangers associated with fracking can be summarized into five headings. Direct dangers to human health and to animal and plant health arising from chemicals used in the fracking process and the likelihood of them entering into our water supply systems. The possibility of fracking technology triggering seismic tremors, as we've heard about in earlier debates to, um, tonight, and the, in the extreme earthquakes, as apparently happened uh, not so far from Blackpool in 2011. The implications by building a cheap gas economy of worsening our carbon footprint at the very time we should be putting every priority in reducing our fo fossil fuel usage and investing in reducing demand for fuels by insulation and fuel e efficiency programs and reorientating our energy systems into using renewable low carbon technologies. Fourthly, the highly questionable principle of giving developers a carte blanche to enter people's property or dig under their land under a blanket assumed permission to do so, undermining the checks and balances which have been carefully crafted into our town and country planning systems. And fifthly, the environmental squalor which fracking has left in its wake in so many of those communities in North America which have been blighted as a result of the fracking invasion of their countryside. And now this bill will allow fracking companies to walk away from their clapped out equipment which they leave under the ground after them. We are told of the economic benefits that will flood into these areas as a result of fracking. But all experience shows this to be a total nonsense. Only a handful of jobs are created and they usually go to migrant workers <coughs> who move from location to location as the fracked out wells are exhausted, leaving behind them the industrial squalor so often associated with extractive industries. We are told there will be immense wealth from exploiting these untapped reserves of gas, but that wealth doesn't go to the communities which have suffered the ravages of exploitation. They go to the supranational corporations, which are only too ready to respond to the government's inducements. And of course, the money will go to the Treasury to bail out a near bankrupt economy, with the danger of being squandered in the same way as happened to the UK's North Sea oil reserves. Local families, local communities, and local, the lo local environment pays the price, and distant pockets 
bulge for the proceeds. All these are matters of concern to me, but let me concentrate in the limited time we have available at report stage on the dangers of chemicals contaminating the water systems of those areas where fracking takes place. We in Wales provide water not only for our own communities, but for many English conurbations in northwest England, in the Midlands, and in probably increasing quantities to southern England. The purity and safety of those water supplies have been taken for granted. Let me mention just some of the chemicals which are used in the fracking process. Each fracking job requires between a million and eight million ga gallons of water, and each such job uses 40,000 gallons of chemicals, involving as many as 600 different chemicals, including uh, ca carcinogens and toxins such as lead, uranium, mercury, ethanol glycol, radium, methanol, hydrochloric acid, and formaldehyde. In the United States, there have been over a thousand cases of contaminated drinking water in locations next to areas of gas drilling, and these have led to cases of sensory, respiratory, and neurological damage, which has been attributed to ingesting contaminated water. Less than 50% of the fracturing uh, fluid is recovered. The remainder of the toxic fluid is left in the ground and overwhelmingly, it's not biodegradable. In the United States, waste fluid is often left in open air pits to evaporate, releasing harmful volatile organic compounds into the atmosphere, creating contaminated air, acid rain, and ground level ozone. A whole plethora of legal cases have arisen in the United States. In April this year, the Parr family in Texas were awarded three million pounds damages against the Aruba fracking company for the pollution of air, water, and soil which had free, uh, seriously impacted on their family's health. The following month, May of this year, there was a, a rig blowout in Morgan County, Ohio, with a spillage of 184 barrels of toxic, toxic fracking fluid, which apparently reached the nearby waterway. In Pennsylvania this June, the fracking company was fined almost $200,000 for a toxic hydraulic fracturing fluid spill of over 200,000 gallons into the local environment, which led to the evacuation of local families from their homes. In Texas in August, it was reported that in a survey of 100 water wells up to three kilometers away from the fracking locations, over 30% had arsenic levels above the safety limit. A survey by Dale University has shown, again in Pennsylvania, that water sources showed an elevated level of methane in locations a kilometer or more distant from drilled areas. In some instances, the methane concentration was so high as to be explosive. Britain is much more densely populated than the United States, with consequently higher likelihood of water sources used for human or animal consumption being polluted. Given this sort of experience, it's a little surprise that states such as Vermont have banned fracking since 2012. They did so in the words of the state governor, Peter uh, Shumlin, in order for R Vermont to, and I quote, preserve its clean water, its lakes, its rivers, and its quality of life. I was told graphically when in America this last August by Professor Alina Jones, Professor of Economics in South Dakota University, that the economic benefit gained in her state from fracking had been attained at an environmental and social price, which was a profound disaster. Other parts of America are awakening to the dangers of fracking. Only last Tuesday, as we heard earlier, the city of Denton in Texas, in the heart of fracking company, voted in a referendum to ban any new fracking operations. Civilized European countries who put the safety of life and the environment above commercial profiteering have banned fracking. France have done so since 2011. Both Germany and the Netherlands have placed a moratorium on it. And that's what my party, Plaid Cymru, has called for also. However, in these amendments, I'm urging the House to take a first step towards a moratorium throughout Britain by refusing to carry forward clauses 32 and 33 of this bill. They were inserted in a blind moment in committee and let the whole House reject them emphatically. I urge the House to take that step. If for whatever reason I can't carry the House with me, as I suspect may be the case having heard earlier debates, if I can't carry um, the, the, the House with me, then at the very least, I implore the House to pass Amendment 114, which would not only allow the provisions of this section of the bill to be applied in Wales if it was so approved by the National Assembly, and it allows them also to impose whatever conditions they deem fit on any fracking development. My hope, hope would be that they, irrespective of what happens in England, would say no to fracking in Wales. Might I add, however, that there are 
cross-border issues relating to fracking. My parliamentary colleague, Howell Williams, MP for Carnarvon, was told in a parliamentary answer that fracking developments in northwest England may well look to Wales for enormous supplies of water they will need for those purposes. As noble lords will be aware, water is a somewhat incendiary substance in Wales, and any suggestion of the drowning of further valleys in Wales to provide for water for fracking in England, no doubt without any compensatory payment, will generate a howl of outrage the length and breadth of my nation. Water is to Wales what oil is to Scotland, so let there be no misunderstanding whatsoever that the exploitation of water resources in Wales, without the sanction of the National Assembly and without adequate payment, is a non-starter and will be fought every step of the way. I can't make it any clearer than that. In many ways, it would be totally perverse not to devolve to the National Assembly responsibility for allowing, banning, um, or putting conditions on fracking in Wales. I say this because the Assembly has responsibility for virtually all aspects of town and country planning in Wales. It has total responsibility for the environment, as it does for agriculture. It has responsibility for the healthcare services in Wales. All these are policy portfolios which are impacted by the effects of the fracking. If Wales is to have a coherent public policy, then control of fracking must also be devolved. Indeed, the government have tacitly admitted this in their response to the report of the House of Commons Committee on Welsh Affairs in regard to their report uh, on energy generation in Wales. The committee's recommendation six stated that the UK government and the Welsh government should cooperate on regu re regulatory and planning matters, including um, the environmental risks associated with hydraulic frac fracking. The government's response was that planning is a devolved matter. That being so, surely the government must accept the thrust of my amendment. Incidentally, I would be grateful to the uh, noble lady, the minister, uh, when she's replying, if we could have some clarification as to whether these draconian provisions will apply to Scotland directly or whether the Scottish Parliament has some control over their applicability. I suspect that if you were to tell Mr Salmon that Scotland will have to f uh, allow fracking willy-nilly by Westminster diktat, there will be such an eruption north of Hadrian's Wall as to reopen the whole relationship between this place and Hollywood, Holyrood. If and if Westminster are to allow a Scottish veto over fracking, then on what earthly basis is such a provision to be denied to Wales? My Lords, my preferred outcome of this debate would be for the Government to withdraw or for the House to vote these appalling new clauses out of the Bill. In the failure to do this, I would implore the Government to accept my Amendment 114 to allow the National Assembly for Wales to determine these matters in Wales or to undertake to bring forward their own clause in another place for the same purpose. Whichever way, this issue is not going to go away. I beg to move. Page 38, line 15. At end, insert the words as printed. I, I don't want in any way to uh, suggest that uh, Wales shouldn't have its uh, own authority over this area. As a, uh, as a citizen of Cornwall, um, I would uh, absolutely agree. I, I don't know, I, in fact, I don't know enough about what the, uh, what, the, what the relationship is. But the one thing I do want to say is about the attack on fracking, in that uh, down in Cornwall, our geology is not there for shale gas at all. But the geology we do have is around geothermal, deep geothermal, of which fracking is an important part. And uh, I, I know the, the noble lord, I think, on the whole, said fracking in relation to uh, shale gas. I mean, there are issues around uh, fracking for whatever, and, and seismic events are one of them. Uh, in one of the early uh, uh, geothermal uh, tests in Alsace, uh, um, under EU uh, uh, funding, then uh, there were seismic events there. A lot has been learnt from that. There were in uh, Blackpool, but as I understand it, uh, uh, the industry is able on the right locations to be able to make sure that is very, very, very uh, well controlled. The only point, the, the point I want to make is that fracking can be good. It can be good for renewables, and I would hope that uh, in the longer term future that uh, fracking will be available for uh, deep, uh, deep uh, geothermal in terms of uh, power uh, generation. At the moment we look like we're going to be going through a heat revolution on, uh, on quite, not quite so deep uh, geothermal but uh, in the long term we will get to, uh, to actually generate uh, baseload electricity through deep geothermal and on that uh, I wanted to make that point because fracking is not just around shale gas it has those other benefits as well in terms of Wales it should be able to steer its own course
uh, my lords, uh, I uh, rise Dean to make a very um, brief comment just to really ask the Baroness Minister for her comments on uh, on the issue of devolution and fracking. And in particular, as the Noble Lord Lord Wigby has raised, um, I'm particularly interested about the Scottish question, partly because, uh, as I understand it, Holyrood already controls planning permission and permitting regime, so it wouldn't actually be a, a huge step to uh, devolve um, this aspect of, uh, of the control of fracking and the, the rights of access. Um, so really, I just uh, rise to ask that question. I'm also grateful to the Noble Lord Lord Everson for, for drawing uh, the, the attention of the House to the fact that when we talk about these provisions and rights of access, they apply to more than just the extraction of petroleum, and indeed they apply to um, deep geothermal, which arguably needs the, uh, the loophole to be uh, changed more urgently than indeed the, uh, the fracking of oil and gas. It, and actually, I just would also just add to that that, um, and maybe this might change perhaps the Labour Lord of Wigley's view of this, is that you can actually frack coal as well. And fracking of uh, deep mine coal might maybe bring uh, a, a degree of uh, economic development back to Wales. I'm not saying that I'm say that's the only way that Wales should develop, and I'm much more interested in some of the marine technologies and indeed uh, biomass and, and, and wind uh, in, a, in a Welsh context that seems to be. Uh, have huge potential, but I would never uh, rule out the idea that uh, deep uh, coal mining could come back uh, as a, an economic activity if done in combination with carbon capture and storage. So, uh, in summary, uh, these clauses do relate to more than just, potentially relate more than just uh, uh, oil and gas extraction, and uh, well, I am interested in the Noble Baroness's response on the Scottish question. Uh, my Lords, um, I note the stand part um, amendments and the amendment proposed by the Noble Lord, Lord uh, Wigley, regarding the application of the right to use deep level land for the purposes of exploiting petroleum or deep geothermal energy in Wales. Um, my Lords, the Government supports the development of shale gas and oil. Um, natural gas from shale could play a crucial role in supporting UK energy security as well as an important role as part of the transition to a low-carbon economy, and I think that was well debated um, in a previous debate. Um, my Lords, the carbon footprint of UK-produced shale, shale gas would likely be significantly less than coal and lower than imported um, LNG. Domestic shale gas could also benefit the UK in terms of jobs tax revenues and growth, mitigating some of the falling revenues from the North Sea. But, my Lords, it has become clear that difficulties in obtaining underground access pose a barrier to exploring this new industry. Um, the same problem also applies to deep geothermal, the deep ge geothermal industry, which is likewise at an early stage of development in the UK. Um, new lateral drilling methods that can cover much larger areas underground mean that existing processes for obtaining underground access can be disproportionately costly and time-consuming in relation to the potential benefits. Um, my Lords, currently companies must negotiate rights of access with every landowner living above underground drilling, and if these negotiations fail, an oil and gas operator can make an application to the Secretary of State who may refer the matter to the courts. Um, this process gives a single landowner the power to significantly delay a development, and in the case of geothermal, it's likely to stop the project entirely. Um, my, my laws, the right to use deep level land would help unlock exploration for shale gas and deep geothermal as we move towards a low carbon economy. But let me be clear, we are not proposing any changes to the regime for surface access and the regulatory system that deals with the potential risks associated with drilling and hydraulic fracturing will remain the same. Um, I would like to reassure Noble Lords that a company looking to develop shale or geothermal would still need to obtain all the necessary permissions like planning and environmental permits and the onshore oil and gas industry has committed to engaging with communities at the early stage of operations, as well as consulting through the planning application process. My Lords, our robust regulation will protect residents um, uh, while allowing this source of homegrown energy to develop in a way that is fair to communities. Um, my Lords, EY has estimated a thriving industry could mean 64,500 jobs nationally. Um, and locally, that could mean cementing contracts for new facilities and jobs for local companies. Communities that host shale development could see a share of this, which is why we welcome 
the developers' community benefit package, similar to other technologies, as, such as wind. My, uh, this will pay £100,000 per hydraulically fractured well site ex exploratory stage to communities and 1% of revenue, if successfully, if it goes into production. Um, like wind farms, my Lord's wider communities will benefit too, as local councils will be able to retain 100% of the business rates they collect from the productive, uh, from productive shale gas. Um, so there are many potentials of this industry to communities in Wales if shale production takes place. Um, my Lord's petroleum extraction is n a non-devolved matter, and as such, the proposals for oil and gas will apply across England, Wales and Scotland. The proposals on deep geothermal energy also cover England, Wales and Scotland, where in Scotland deep geothermal energy is exploited for the sole or main purpose of electricity generation. A Schedule 7 to the Government of Wales Act 2006 sets out the conferred subjects over which the Welsh Assembly can exercise legislative competence. Oil and gas are clear exemptions from the conferred list of economic development and furthermore the exploitation of deep geothermal resources uh, should, could not be considered to have been conferred under any of the subjects in the Schedule 7. Um, so, my Lords, although deep geothermal and oil and gas activity may impact upon conferred subjects, such as environmental protection, that is not what they properly relate to for the purposes of the legislative competence test in the Government of Wales Act 2006. Uh, my Lord, in addition, the right of use clauses are not removing any existing regulatory requirements. We therefore see no ground on which this measure would be within the legislative competence of the Welsh Assembly. On that basis, there is no rationale for requiring approval by the Welsh Assembly before the section can apply in Wales. My Lord, it's also worth noting that while oil and gas are non-devolved matters, all existing planning authority procedures and powers will remain in place and as such the different UK planning regimes will continue to regulate shale and gas and uh, shale and gas or geothermal developments according to their existing planning procedures so my lords I have reflected on the noble lords amendment um, and I think in response to the noble lords concerns that I've offered him um, a government perspective and um, so on that um, I do hope that the noble Lord, um, Lord Wigley, will withdraw his amendments. I'm very grateful um, to those who are taking part in this debate and to the noble lady, the minister, for um, her response. Quite clearly, I would be unlikely to carry the House on the clauses not standing part of the bill, <laughs> although my heart would want me to go down that road. I suspect that I would be coming to a blind alley, and therefore um, I won't press that on this occasion because... Uh, there will be opportunities in another place, and I have no doubt that many members of all parties in the other place will wish to come back to this, because there is deep concern outside. And even if one was in favour, in principle, of fracking, I would have thought that it would have been very wise indeed to take the maximum possible attention and notice of the reservations that exist outside, because these are real fears of real people in real communities, and they need to be addressed. And I think that members in all parts of the House have expressed that in the series of debates that we've had tonight. If I may turn, therefore, to the lead amendment um, in my group um, relating to the powers of the National Assembly for Wales. It's very ironic because this time tomorrow, a little earlier tomorrow, as the noble Lord, Lord Bourne sitting on the government front bench will be very well aware, the first amendment that we have is to m change the model of devolution for Wales to a reserved powers model of the sort that exists for uh, Northern Ireland and Scotland. And this was the recommendation of the Silk Committee, of which the noble Lord Lord Bourne was a member, and which appeared to have all party support at the committee stage in this House. The report stage takes place tomorrow. That being so, unless there was a specific exemption made for these purposes, it would not be enough to rely on the 2006 Act, which the noble lady, the minister, uh, has relied on in her debate tonight. But rather than argue technical, um, legalistic points arising out of legislation, I would just put this to her in conclusion, that when the National Assembly for Wales has responsibility for the environment, particularly for town and country planning, for transport, for economic development within Wales, as well as um, health uh, proposals, then surely it makes all sense 
to get the responsibility for this area also into their hands. At the very least, to make sure that there is a working together. And that surely was the intention of the government when it responded to the Select Committee of Welsh Affairs report, where I, I quote it, so I won't quote again, but it was underlining the fact that policy, planning is a devolved matter and that planning is integrally involved in the decisions we're talking about in regards to fracking. So I would ask the noble um, lady whether she would um, take this away between now and the debates in another place, just to give further thought to it, particularly in the light of the debate that we'll have on the Wales Bill tomorrow, to see whether there isn't a mechanism to make sure that the National Assembly in Wales and the Government of Wales are totally on board in a dialogue in regards to these matters, and that in the principle of subsidiarity, that decisions affecting commun communities can be taken as close as possible to those communities, and in this context, decisions affecting Wales can be taken by the National Assembly where it's possible to do so. On that basis, I beg leave to um, withdraw the amendment. Is it your Lordship's pleasure that the amendment be withdrawn? The amendment is by leave withdrawn. Amendment 115, Baroness, Baroness Young, not moved. Uh, amendment 115A, Baroness Worthington, not moved. Uh, Lord Wigley, amendments 115B and C, not moved. Uh, in clause 34, amendment 115D, Lord Whitty. My Lord, I beg to move amendment 115D. Um, my Lords, uh, I'm trying to help the government out here. Uh, this is yet another part of the jigsaw that is necessary to ensure public acceptability of fracking in appropriate circumstances. This amendment deals with the issue of when there is damage caused uh, by fracking uh, and who is liable for it. My Lords, we've had a debate about the uh, nature of the regulations and uh, whether they are uh, effective or not and whether there are enough uh, uh, resources to uh, enforce uh, those regulations. But my Lords, even if we all accept that we have world-class regulations and world-class regulators in this area, if tracking takes off in the way in which its, uh, its proponents, and to some extent myself, uh, would hope it would, uh, then there will be hundreds of sites across Britain uh, and however good the regulatory process, however vigilant the regulators themselves, uh, however well motivated uh, those who are responsible for, uh, as companies for those operations, there will be problems. There is no prior form of energy where there hasn't been some accidents uh, some leakages, uh, some effects on the environment, on neighbours, on businesses uh, and uh, on the water supply. Now, my lords, failure of even a fraction of the number of wells which is being talked about could have a significant impact. It could have an impact on the landowner, the farmer, it could have uh, an impact on uh, uh, um, the community close to the fracking site, it could have an effect on individual households or individuals indeed, uh, or it could have an effect on other businesses, whether small local businesses or giant water companies. We do therefore need to ensure that we have an effective liability arrangement which ensures that the cost of such uh, damage and the remediation of such damage do not fall on the public purse. And we have historic examples here in the energy field, whether you're talking about uh, deep coal mining or whether you're talking about open cast coal mining, whether you're talking about the nuclear industry and the cost of decommissioning there, the reality has been that the costs of damage, the costs of waste, the costs of pollution uh, have been borne almost entirely by the taxpayer. And I want to see here uh, a provision whereby that does not arise in the case of substantial development of a fracking industry. My amendment, therefore, would deal with uh, the Secretary of State's obligation to bring forward regulations to ensure that any operator within this field, whether in the exploratory or subsequent stages, has sufficient resources uh, to cover any loss arising from the operation and the costs of remediation 
uh, and the costs incurred by the public authorities in enforcing that. Uh, my Lords, that require, may require a separate fund within the company or it may require a common fund. Uh, that is, uh, I leave to the Secretary of State uh, in the regulations. But such provision is necessary. And I am afraid the Minister's reply when I raised this issue in rather similar form during committee stage um, raises several concerns. Um, it was argued by the Minister that companies can be required uh, to remediate the effects and prevent further damage of pollution under existing regulations. But, my Lords, in general, that only applies if land, it, land itself is contaminated in the strict terms of those regulations. And it is not clear uh, that funds need to be available from the outset uh, to foot the cost of this remediation activity. Uh, my Lords, the Minister made a big point of saying we should not treat fracking differently from other industries um, and that existing law is robust. But, my Lords, I only have to look at one of the examples I mentioned, open cast mining in Scotland, which cost uh, 200 million in Scotland alone, uh, which was f the entire cost fell on the public first. My amendment also, therefore, seeks to ensure that that would not arise in this case, uh, that the fund would be provided, as it were, in advance and would be, in effect, bankruptcy proof. The Minister also argued that the environment regulators do already have the power, uh, though not a requirement, to require upfront financial bonds to address the risk wherever they deem that necessary. Uh, and indeed there is a, a European directive, the Mining Waste Directive, uh, Article 14, which is relevant. However, it is very limited. It only relates to the situation where the waste itself is hazardous uh, or is managed in a Category A site. Now, neither of those things need apply for very substantial damage to be caused uh, if there is some leakage or other damage uh, caused by the fracking operations. Uh, my Lords, these amendments are fairly straightforward. They require anticipating what has happened in other industries in advance at the same point as we are designing the, the permitting system uh, for fracking operations. It would be a very substantial piece of foresight by the government to introduce such requirements and to ensure, therefore, that the operators within this field did have sufficient resources to meet such uh, contingencies. But probably more important, and to outline a point I made on my brief intervention earlier, it is also a vital part of ensuring that the public, uh, the businesses and the communities and the landowners who are anxious about the effects of, planning, of, of fracking are reassured from the outset uh, that if something does go seriously wrong, then their interests will be respected. And that it will not be the taxpayer who pays, but the operator, Lord Demon, in, who is no longer in his place, said at an early stage it should be clear in relation to the enforcement of, uh, of uh, regulations uh, that the, uh, if, if you like, that the polluter pays, uh, and that must be true also in relation to the, any negative effects that require action and remediation as a result of those operations. So, my Lords, it is a reassurance and it may, in extremis, become an absolutely necessary reassurance so that we don't actually go through the sequence of events which followed earlier generations of energy exploitation in coal and in nuclear power, where there is no such liability uh, placed uh, on the uh, operator, but in fact the taxpayer has paid and is continuing to pay, and in the case of nuclear in particular, will continue to pay for many generations to come. Let's anticipate that and at the same time reassure large sections of the community who may not have any fundamental Lord Wigley type objection uh, to fracking, but nevertheless are anxious about their own interests and the effect it may have on their own businesses and their own way of life. So, my Lords, I beg to move. Amendment proposed, page 39, line 18, at end, insert the words as printed on the Marshal's list. My Lords, when I saw the Noble Lord's Amendment, 
Um, my immediate reaction was to say, well, as he has said, look what has happened in other industries, um, and notably the uh, nuclear industry, and then look and see what has been happening recently in relation to offshore oil and the measures that are now being taken there. So that led me to approach the Trade Association, which covers the uh, fracking industry, uh, and uh, they were extremely helpful. Um, <clears throat> there is a very long paper of guidance produced by my noble friend's department uh, on the whole question of uh, uh, petroleum licensing financial guidance. And uh, I won't, at this hour of the night, <coughs> when there's other further business to come, go into that in great detail. But uh, the fact of the matter is that having read that, and having read the paper that has been produced by the um, Trade Association, U UK OOG, I am satisfied, I have to say, that the difficulties which the noble Lord, Lord Whitty, has raised are in fact being addressed very positively indeed. It's not only the uh, <coughs> question of whether the company that will get a license will have the resources to, to carry out the work and continue to operate any uh, shale gas well that it uh, constructs, but it addresses very specifically the question that he has made most of, both of the question of uh, um, the decommissioning of plant, but also the question of financial liability if things go wrong. Um, the regime that exists provides for the remediation of environmental damage and contaminated land, and that includes water. And if you take all the regulations together, if a company causes damage, harm, or pollution to the environment, they can be required under the regimes in force to remediate the effects and prevent further damage and the same approach as, as applies to other industries. And furthermore, the government appears to me to have very clear powers that they can require financial evidence that, that there are resources that will be available to pay for that. Um, and I have to say, I think the, the, the UK OOG has um, relieved my anxieties in this effect. I think unlike the earlier industries to which the noble Lord, Lord Whitty uh, referred, I think that the approach to this industry, still as he has rightly said at a very early stage of its, of its development, has been extremely responsible. And I shall be very interested to hear from my noble friend um, if there are, are, if, what these measures actually are. Um, I am satisfied, but uh, I will listen to my noble friend's reply. Lords, I've been glad to put my name on this amendment, which I think is very wise and uh, uh, prudent. Um, <clears throat> it has been suggested in recent years that the interpretation of welfare capitalism has changed. That the concept was originally that capitalism had a social responsibility which it should discharge for the well-being of society as a whole. It seems to be that quite a lot of people have come to believe that perhaps welfare capitalism is about ensuring that while wealth generation and profit is privatized, risk is uh, nationalized and the responsibility of the taxpayer. And, and I think therefore that uh, the point in the amendment which is particularly important in this context is what happens in case of insolvency when all the best predictions can go to the be blown away in the wind in, in the uh, chaos that follows. Now, my lords, I think that if a scheme is being put forward and is being properly costed, the cost of dealing with potential damage or closure or the consequences is essential element in, in the calculations. And while we are concentrating this evening, particularly on this aspect of this new exciting aspect of shale development, we are beginning to get quite a, 
a, a, a, quite a litter of potential um, um, no longer required infrastructure across the country in connection with, ge uh, with, with power generation and its distribution. And I think we need to be very careful uh, that we are ensuring that any adverse results of this are not just left for the taxpayer to settle, but that they are the responsibility of the people who, while they're operating, are receiving the profits that go from that. My Lord, I'm grateful for my noble uh, friend uh, for tabling uh, his amendment and uh, indeed uh, for continuing the discussion that we started in, during committee. Um, I am um, sympathetic to the, the intention behind these amendments and uh, I'm particularly interested in the aspect of liability arising from orphan sites. Um, we are talking about potentially a, a new industry here which will see a larger number of distributed sites developed. And uh, we may well see smaller companies who perhaps don't have the traditional assets or, um, or, or deep pockets of uh, traditional, more traditional extractive companies. And it would seem to me that there would be quite a potential for orphan sites to rise. Um, and in that case, uh, I'm very interested in, in hearing from the Labour Baroness the Minister as to how we would, um, how would we address uh, any liability arising in those sites. And uh, I think it was... Uh, um, the noble Baroness, uh, noble uh, Lord Lawitty, he said that he's um, uh, seeking to, for the government to demonstrate foresight. I mean, it does strike me as, uh, that the government is demonstrating foresight in some respects of fracking and imagining the future benefits and the future economic wealth that's going to come. We've even heard comments over the weekend, and we'll debate this shortly, about uh, imagined spending of all of this great tax revenue. Um, foresight is possible. Um, perhaps we should apply foresight in a slightly more uh, realistic context of, of just imagining and, and learning from other previous experiences of extractive industries and trying to plan for uh, what happens if everything doesn't go according to plan. I would have thought perhaps that uh, uh, insurance would be something that uh, companies would be able to take out for some of these liabilities. And again, I'd be interested to hearing from the no Barrow Minister as to what, uh, uh, what type of insurance she might expect these companies to undertake and, and what what liabilities would be insured um, by these companies. As I say, uh, we are entering into uncharted territory in terms of the types of companies, the types of uh, uh, projects and their distribution across the country. Um, I think it is right that we should uh, uh, proceed with caution and I, I think there's uh, quite a lot of merit in the, uh, the amendments that Noble Lord Whitty has, has tabled. Uh, he started out by saying he was uh, trying to help the government out. Um, a number of us have tried to help the government out uh, during tonight's debate. I'm afraid uh, I can't. Uh, I, I suspect uh, that the government is not listening and does not want to be helped out. But there we are. We we'll look forward to the comments from the Baroness um, in response to this amendment. Um, my lords, um, I'm always grateful to the noble Lord Lord Whitty for trying to help the government out. Um, and of course, I do recognise his concerns and those raised by um, the noble Lord Lord Judd. Um, but I think um, that in in and listening very carefully, I must stress and. And I think my noble friend, um, my noble friend Lord Jenkins, put it very eloquently that there is already a lot in place addressing um, the noble Lord Lord Whitty's concerns. Um, my lords, uh, the existing regulatory system covering onshore oil and gas is robust. We already have over 50 years of experience of regulating the oil and gas industry, and there are controls and regulations in place to ensure on-site safety, prevent uh, safety, prevent water contamination, mitigate seismic activity, and minimise air emissions. Um, whilst the government, my lord, is keen for, uh, for shale and geothermal exploration to go ahead, uh, shale gas must be safe and environmentally sound. And I agree with noble lords that you know, we, we need to ensure that we are responding to the concerns that are, that are raised as a perception by the public. Um, so we need to be absolutely robust in our response. Um, but one of the central aims of the cu current regulatory framework is to ensure that wells are appropriately designed and operated, and when operations cease, that they are properly decommissioned. Uh, my Lords, a petroleum licence cannot search for 
bore for or get petroleum without a petroleum exploration and development license, the terms of which are in the model clauses set out in secondary legislation. All drilling or production operations and the abandonment of any well requires the consent of the Secretary of State. In addition, there are regulators and controls that uh, can be relied upon to minimise risk and any impacts associated with oil and gas activities. Um, my Lords, these, include, um, these controls include conditions attached to environmental permits issued under the Environmental Permitting Regulations 2010 in England and Wales and the equivalent regime in Scotland, as well as safety scrutiny by the Health and Safety Executive. Uh, my Lords, the current regime, as it applies to shale gas, includes the management of mining waste and naturally occurring radioactive minerals, the scrutiny of well design and construction, the suitable restoration of sites, the protection of habitats, and ten different EU directives addressing environmental concerns. In addition, the Environmental Protection, Protection Act 1990 and the Domestic Environmental Damage Prevention and Re Remediation Regulations 2009 provide for the remediation of contaminated land and serious environmental damage. My Lords, this regime, together with the operator's responsibilities under their license and permit, is sufficiently robust to ensure that operators are required to remediate any damage or pollution to the environment. If for any reason, my Lords, these controls were not enough, and we have no reason to think that this would be the case, because the UK has a well-developed and a very strong regulatory um, regime, and if any change were to occur, then in accordance with statutory requirements and government policy, remediation of the damage would be dealt with, uh, dealt with under the main regimes for dealing with contamination. These regimes are sufficiently robust to ensure that if a company causes damage, harm or pollution to the environment, then under these regimes, operators can be required to remediate the effects and prevent damage or pollution. This is the same approach that applies to other industries, and we believe that the existing law is robust. My Lords, the environmental regulators do have the powers, as so rightly highlighted by noble lords, to require upfront financial guarantees to address this risk in circumstances where they deem this to be necessary. In addition, mineral planning authorities can require a financial guarantee to cover restoration and aftercare costs, although this will normally only be justified in exceptional cases. The government has also been working with the industry's trade body, UK Onshore Oil and Gas, to ensure that the development of a mutual industry scheme that would, when necessary, step in and pay for necessary remedial action in the event that the liable company, uh, liable company is unable to do so. Um, my department has powers which can be exercised to require membership of such a scheme where one exists or the provision of equi equivalent security by other means. Um, my Lord, this range of financial securities, along with the statutory regime for dealing with damage or pollution, provide the reassurance that taxpayers or landowners won't be left to foot the bill for liabilities. Um, my Lord, since the noble Lord, Lord Whitty, raised these concerns in Grand Committee last month, I have given um, this issue particular consideration. Um, while I'm confident that we have a strong regulatory um, system for managing liabilities, I have heard concerns regarding unintended impacts of the right to use deep level land on landowners, specifically the situation whereby a landowner whose land is uh, accessed through our proposed legislation might uh, face claims from third parties for damage done by the operator. And I have reflected on that and intend to bring an amendment on that particular issue. Um, but, my Lords, I hope I've been clear on other issues um, that the Noble Lord has raised. Um, and I hope, given the reassurances that we already have a very robust um, uh, framework in place, that the Noble Lord... shares with me gratitude for the full way in which the Minister is replying. But there's just one point she's made which intrigues me. She says that the regulator can, has powers which he can use in these contexts. But if it's the taxpayer who is faced with the possibility of having to foot the bull, 
Why is it not compulsory to require that these things are covered? I'd hoped that um, through going through um, my contribution that I would have um, reassured noble laws that we don't um, wish to see the taxpayer foot the bill or any bill um, and that there will be processes in place to ensure that. Um, so I do hope that having gone through um, the noble Lord, Lord Whitty's amendment and his concerns, that he will um, see fit, fit to withdraw his amendments. Grateful for the uh, noble Baroness's full reply and for the uh, um, matters which Lord Jenkins drew, drew to our attention. I mean, it, it is, has always been clear to me that the government have the powers and the authority, regulatory authorities have the powers to require remediation. The issue I was <coughs> attempting to cover was what if they did not have sufficient funds to do that? Uh, and the noble Baroness says, well, uh, there is the ability of the authorities to say in granting a license that you have to provide some money up front. There was also reference to a mutual scheme. It would seem to me it would be prudent if the government actually made that a condition of the license, either that there was a fund established or that you were a member of this scheme uh, which is being established by the, by the industry. Otherwise, we will end up with a situation where, by accident, as a result of an unforeseen accident, combined with financial problems for the company, uh, or as a result many years hence of an abandoned site, an orphan site, or, or a site which has been badly decommissioned, uh, there is some damage. Then there is no funds available to cover it. So at the end of the day, the taxpayer will pay. So I would, I accept a lot of what the, the, the noble Baroness says and what Lord Jenkins said, uh, but at the end of the day, unless this is a condition of license, either by insurance or by establishing a fund, then we haven't got the situation entirely covered and it is not entirely reassuring to those who are worried about the potential impact uh, on their own environment, uh, business or, or, uh, or dwellings. So, my lords, I think the Minister has gone some considerable way, uh, and I'm certainly not pressing it any further tonight, uh, but I don't think it is quite as reassuring uh, as I had hoped. Uh, but I nevertheless thank her uh, and others who contributed, and I beg leave to withdraw. It is your Lordship's pleasure that the amendment be withdrawn. It is by leave withdrawn. After Clause 37, Amendment 116, in the name of Baroness Kramer. Um, my Lords, as you know, this Government is committed to an ambitious action to reduce carbon emissions and increase renewable energy generation in the UK. To this end, the non-domestic renewable heat incentive was introduced in November 2011 and followed with a domestic scheme in April this year. My Lords, these schemes are the world's first long-term financial support programme.